water levels at the Panama Canal are actually causing a traffic jam in one of the largest trading routes in the world. 40% of all U.S. container traffic passes through it. About $270 billion of trade each year rides on this ribbon of water. The delays are rippling through the global economy. The Panama Canal, an exceptional shortcut carved through Central America, has revolutionized global trade for more than a century. However, this crucial water route is encountering a significant issue, a water shortage. This shortage of water has caused significant problems in global trade. Join us as we dive into why this is occurring and the potential implications for us all. Global shipping is severely disrupted uh, by Houthi attacks on ships heading to the Suez Canal. But across the Atlantic, the other canal vital to international trade, the Panama Canal, is also suffering from major disruption. Before the Panama Canal, crossing the Atlantic to the Pacific was no easy feat. Picture this, sailors battling fierce winds and perilous waters around South America's tip via the Drake Passage or the Strait of Magellan. But then came a stroke of genius, the Panama Canal. Imagine a massive waterway, a sort of watery shortcut dug through the land bridge linking North and South America. Thanks to this marvel of engineering, ships can zip between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in a fraction of the time, slashing days, even weeks off their journey. Yet the story of this nautical lifesaver stretches far back. Back in the 1500s, Spanish explorers toyed with the idea of a canal, realizing the convenience it would bring. They ponder two spots, Panama and Nicaragua. Panama won out especially after the U.S. pitched in with a railroad in the 1800s. Interestingly, the canal ended up following a path remarkably close to that of the railroad. The first crack at carving a canal through Panama's narrow isthmus began in 1881. Back then, Colombia held the reins over the land and granted permission to a French outfit, the Compagnie Universelle du Canal Interoceanique, to take a swing at it. Leading the charge was none other than Ferdinand de Lesseps, fresh off his triumph with Egypt's Suez Canal. Fired up by past success, De La Ceps aimed for a sea-level canal in Panama, mirroring the oceans on either side. He drummed up considerable investment, rallying ordinary folks to chip in. But not everyone bought into De La Ceps' vision. Engineer Adolf Godin de la Pene, having poured over Panama's terrain, knew it wouldn't fly. He had the lay of the land down pat. About 15 kilometers from the Pacific Ocean lay a formidable barrier known as the Continental Divide. Flanked by two rivers, the Chagres River streaming into the Atlantic and the Rio Grande flowing toward the Pacific, the area caught the attention of Le Pigné. He envisioned something remarkable, artificial lakes. In 1879, Le Pigné proposed an innovative plan. Picture this, dams erected at Gatun and Miraflores forming expansive lakes around 25 meters deep. These lakes would be fed by the rivers, creating a waterway. Le Pigné's stroke of genius didn't end there. He envisioned a channel carved through the mountains, linking the lakes. Ships would traverse this passage, aided by locks to adjust to varying water levels, seamlessly connecting the oceans. While Le Pigné's groundbreaking plan laid the foundation for the Panama Canal, sadly, the French company brushed aside his counsel, leading to a doomed endeavor based on their original vision. This is the Panama Canal. It's a hundred years old. These are the original gates the original locks. It was an amazing feat of engineering. It was designed by the French, finished by the Americans, and 20,000 workers died of malaria and yellow fever constructing this. Ferdinand de Lesseps, the mastermind behind the French company, faced a major hurdle. He underestimated Panama's unique challenges. Unlike the dry and predictable conditions of the Suez Canal, Panama was a whole different ballgame. It was a steamy, disease-ridden jungle, battered by heavy rains, scorching heat, and rugged terrain ranging from swampy lowlands to towering mountains of the Continental Divide. Despite having skilled engineers, the overall plan lacked focus and adaptation to Panama's specific conditions. The machinery they bought, tailored for the desert-like Suez environment, fell short of the rugged Panamanian landscape. Add to that the onslaught of tropical diseases, claiming numerous lives, and you have a recipe for disaster. Despite the Herculean efforts, constructing the canal turned out to be exorbitantly costly and painfully slow. In a bid to save money, the French company switched gears, 
opting for a more cost-effective design using locks to manage water levels instead of a sea-level canal. Yet this tweak failed to turn the tide. As the project teetered on the brink of financial ruin, the French public's trust in both the canal and its leadership waned. Despite desperate attempts to secure more funds, the company went belly up in 1889. Though there was a feeble attempt to revive it in 1894, it fizzled out by 1898. Their dream of completing the Panama Canal crumbled. Their sole focus became holding on long enough to offload the unfinished project. Tragically, much of the excavation work they poured their efforts into never saw the light of day in the later American-built canal. America stepped in with a glimmer of hope in 1902, with the United States Congress passing the Spooner Act. With a green light from the Spooner Act, the U.S. could acquire the French company's gear and assets to construct the canal. But there was a catch. They needed Colombia's blessing as it governed Panama. Yet talks with Colombia hit a snag. Seizing the moment, Panama, backed by the U.S., declared independence from Colombia in November 1903. The U.S. promptly acknowledged Panama's sovereignty, paving the way for bilateral negotiations. These talks birthed the hay bunau varia Treaty in February 1904, meeting the Spooner Act's terms. The treaty carved out the Panama Canal Zone, putting the U.S. in charge. With this pact in place, the U.S. rolled up its sleeves and dove into the colossal task of building the canal in earnest by the summer of 1904. Taking a page from the French playbook, they opted for a canal with locks, a cost-effective solution that sidestepped potential headaches caused by differing sea levels. Yet hurdles remained. Enter the Chagres River, a wild card flowing from Panama's northeastern mountains to the Atlantic. Its unpredictable water levels, driven by rainfall, posed a serious threat. Building the canal nearby risked being at the mercy of raging floods. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt weighed in, backing chief engineer John Frank Stevens. Stevens championed a canal with locks akin to the original concept proposed by Le Pignet, dismissed by the French. His plan? Erect a mammoth dam across the Chagres River at Gatun. This dam pulled double duty. Not only did it tame the river, but it also birthed Gatun Lake, earning the title for the world's largest artificial lake at the time. This lake served a dual purpose. It tamed the mighty Chagres River, even during its wild floods, and it became a vital segment of the canal's path, stretching a whopping 20 miles. Constructing the canal was no small feat. It demanded a workforce of over 40,000 individuals at its peak. Most hailed from the West Indies as laborers, while the U.S. supplied engineers, administrators, and skilled workers. Talk about engineering against all odds. The project required cutting-edge tools and equipment, with railroads playing a pivotal role in material and supply transportation. Among the groundbreaking innovations were the over 100 steam shovels. These behemoth machines were instrumental in carving out the challenging Culebra Cut, later renamed the Gaillard Cut, in tribute to David Dubos Gaillard, the American engineer who led its construction until its passing in 1913. Yet, the Culebra Cut emerged as one of the project's toughest nuts to crack. The ground in the area was anything but stable, prone to frequent landslides and mudslides that tragically claimed many lives during construction. These sudden shifts of earth and mud made planning a nightmare. Even the weight of the surrounding hillsides could cause the excavation bottom to unexpectedly rise. One infamous event was the Cucaracha Slide of 1907, a relentless landslide that persisted for years, dumping tons of material into the canal and causing significant setbacks. Despite these hurdles, workers soldiered on, enduring blistering temperatures exceeding 38 degrees Celsius. Armed with rock drills, dynamite, and trusty steam shovels, they removed an astounding 73 million cubic meters of earth and rock. Their unwavering dedication gradually lowered the excavation floor to within 40 feet of sea level, laying the groundwork for the canal's future. Despite the challenges, setbacks, and tragic losses, the Panama Canal proudly opened its doors to traffic on August 15, 1914. In 10 years, more than 50,000 men and women built a structure of colossal dimensions. On August 15, 1914, the Panama Canal was inaugurated. After over three decades of tireless work, a monumental moment arrived. The Panama Canal even today, stands as one of the most awe-inspiring engineering marvels ever achieved. Its impact on global trade is nothing short of profound. Think of it as the heartbeat of international commerce. 
Just as a doctor gauges a patient's health through their pulse, the number of ships traversing the canal mirrors the pulse of the global economy. Booming economic times bring a flurry of activity, while recessions see a slowdown. This pattern echoes throughout the canal's history. Take 1916, a year of economic woes, when a mere 86 ships made the journey. Contrast that with 1970, a peak year coinciding with global prosperity, boasting a staggering 15,523 transits, a testament to the canal's enduring significance. Despite a dip in the number of ships passing through, the Panama Canal hasn't lost its luster. In fact, it's busier than ever, thanks to larger ships ferrying more cargo. Back in 2000, even with fewer vessels making the transit, the canal still managed to haul a whopping 210 million long tons of goods, reaffirming its status as a crucial trade artery. What's fascinating is that while various routes make use of the canal, the east coast of the United States to East Asia route reigned supreme, handling a significant chunk of the canal's traffic. Now let's talk about traversing the Panama Canal. While it's a godsend for many vessels seeking a shortcut, navigating it isn't a walk in the park. Picture a tightly packed highway with limited space and strict rules for every ship. It's like maneuvering through a busy thoroughfare with designated lanes and regulations everyone must adhere to. The Panama Canal operates on a tight schedule, meaning ships can't just roll up and expect instant passage. They've got to snag a time slot beforehand. Now the real magic happens as ships navigate this engineering marvel. Picture this. Three sets of locks, Miraflores, Pedro Miguel, and Gatun, each with a roll depending on your direction of travel. These locks act like giant elevators, hoisting or lowering ships in stages to different water levels. Let's say you're cruising from the Atlantic to the Pacific. You'll start at Limon Bay, slipping into the canal's embrace and hitting the first lock, Gatun. Here, your vessel gets a lift, rising 85 feet in stages until you're on par with Gatun Lake. This massive man-made reservoir, fed by dams on the Chagres River, spans a whopping 166 square miles and is the canal's backbone. Exiting the lake, you'll sail through a 23-mile channel until you reach Gamboa. And here's where the real spectacle begins. The Gaillard Cut, a marvel of human ingenuity slicing through the continental divide. Imagine cruising through mountains on an eight-mile stretch with depths averaging 43 feet, effortlessly bridging a massive geographical barrier. As you head towards the Pacific Ocean, you'll encounter the Pedro Miguel locks, gently lowering your vessel 30 feet to the level of Miraflores Lake. Then, a brief sail through the channel leads you to the Miraflores locks, where another two-stage descent awaits, bringing you down to sea level. Finally, a seven-mile stretch through a dredged channel guides you into the vast expanse of the Pacific. Throughout this journey, the canal maintains a minimum width of 500 feet, ensuring smooth passage for even the largest ships. Think of the locks as colossal water elevators, powered by gravity-fed flows from nearby lakes like the Chagres River. They're all built uniform in size and come in pairs, enabling ships to sail through in both directions simultaneously. But managing these behemoths demands precision. Only small boats can navigate the locks solo due to their intricate machinery. For larger vessels, electric locomotives step in, these robust machines glide along tracks, flanking the locks, using gears to keep ships centered as they pass through. Ahead of each lock entry, a hefty chain called a fender chain spans the gap, acting as a safety buffer. If a ship approaches at a safe speed, the chain sinks, letting it glide through. But if it's too speedy, the chain holds firm, gently slowing it until it halts. As an added precaution, a second gate stands 50 feet behind the first, adding an extra layer of security. If by some slim chance a ship breaches the first gate, the second gate jumps into action as a failsafe, halting any potential chaos and shielding the entire lock system from harm. It's the perfect blend of ingenious engineering and meticulous maneuvering that guarantees ships sail through the Panama Canal smoothly and safely. The canal is going through its driest spell in more than a century as El Nino brings higher temperatures and less rain. The drought is squeezing global supply chains, and that could mean higher prices and less choice for consumers just in time for the holidays. Each voyage through the Panama Canal demands an astonishing amount of water, around 52 million gallons to be exact. This fresh water serves to lift and lower ships as they navigate the various water level zones. The main water source? 
artificial lakes, with Gatun Lake leading the charge, relying heavily on rainfall to maintain its levels. Yet much of this rainfall eventually trickles back into the ocean, presenting a unique dilemma. Balancing the canal's needs with those of the populace is a delicate dance. After all, the very water sustaining the canal also quenches the thirst of over half of Panama's population, totaling around 4.3 million people. For years, this balance wasn't a pressing issue. Panama boasts one of the planet's rainiest climates, historically keeping the canal and its neighboring lakes well-fed. However, 2023 ushered in a troubling shift. Two key factors converged to trigger a notable decrease in water levels, especially in Gatun Lake. Firstly, there was a widespread drop in rainfall, resulting in a shortfall compared to normal levels. Secondly, the El Niño weather phenomenon made its mark. El Niño, a periodic event, brings warmer ocean temperatures that disrupt typical atmospheric circulation. In places like Panama, this disruption weakens or redirects winds that usually usher in substantial rainfall. The upshot? The Panama Canal found itself grappling with a fresh hurdle, balancing sustainable water management with meeting the needs of local communities. This delicate juggling act has strained Gatun Lake, which now faces a daily deficit of 3 billion liters, losing more water than it gains. The situation has become so dire that Gatun Lake's water level has plummeted to near record lows, even during the rainy season. The Panama Canal stands as a vital artery of global shipping, serving as a crucial link between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, sparing ships the arduous journey around South America's tip. Imagine if this lifeline were to vanish, a catastrophic blow to world trade. Shipping expenses would soar, triggering spikes in commodity prices. Moreover, essential goods could dwindle, as nations depend on the canal for the flow of critical supplies. The recent water shortage gripping the Panama Canal has shown a light on the intricate web of connections within our planet's systems. While the immediate culprit is a lack of rainfall, scientists have uncovered an unexpected contributor. Deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, located thousands of miles away, Despite its distance, the Amazon rainforest plays a pivotal role in regulating the water levels of the Panama Canal. Rainforests like the Amazon act as colossal water pumps for Earth, releasing immense amounts of water vapor into the atmosphere through transpiration. This vapor eventually condenses to form clouds and return as rain, sustaining a continuous cycle. Given its vast expanse, the Amazon is often hailed as a planet's natural air conditioner, influencing local rainfall patterns and even shaping global climate. However, deforestation disrupts this critical cycle, exacerbating the water shortage dilemma. As trees are felled, they lose their ability to release water vapor into the air, resulting in a drop in overall rainfall. With ongoing deforestation, the rainforest can hit a critical point where it struggles to generate enough rain to sustain itself, a phenomenon known as deforestation-induced collapse. The situation in the Amazon is even graver than previously thought. Deforestation not only alters rainfall patterns, but also suggests that parts of the Amazon are becoming net emitters of carbon dioxide, meaning they emit more carbon than they absorb. This troubling development sets off a dangerous chain reaction, as the rainforest releases more carbon and experiences reduced rainfall. Trees weaken, becoming more prone to demise. This further diminishes the rainforest's capacity to generate rain, creating a vicious cycle. The weakened rainforest exacerbates droughts, like the severe one witnessed in 2023, disrupting local and regional rainfall patterns, potentially leading to drier climates thousands of miles away, both north and south of the rainforest. Due to the water shortage, the Panama Canal Authority, tasked with overseeing the waterway, has had to make a tough call. Tonight, billions of dollars in trade to and from the United States is in jeopardy at one of the world's most important shipping routes, the Panama Canal. They've put a cap on the number of ships permitted to traverse the canal. Normally, the canal can smoothly accommodate up to 36 ships daily. Yet with the recent drought, the authority has slashed traffic, allowing only around 20 ships through each day. This unforeseen hurdle has left shipping companies in a bind, facing a slew of challenging options each with its own downside. One route is to linger at anchor, risking mounting costs until a passage slot opens up, a waiting game that could drag on for weeks, causing delays and hitting profits. 
and 40 percent of U.S. container traffic. But with water levels below normal, authorities are only allowing 24 ships to cross a day. For a hefty sum, companies have the option to skip the line, jumping ahead of other vessels by paying a surcharge that can soar up to $4 million. This privilege slashes their wait time significantly. But such a shortcut comes with a hefty price tag, one that not all companies can afford or are willing to foot. Faced with these constraints, many firms opt to forgo the canal altogether, instead charting a course around South America via Cape Horn or the Strait of Magellan. While this sidestep bypasses the weight and potential fees of the canal, it extends their journey significantly, adding days or even weeks to the trip. Recent assaults on ships in the Red Sea, a key trading route, have led to waterway restrictions in the Panama Canal. The recent attacks have already led many companies to steer clear of the Suez Canal. With these disruptions piling up, global shipping is feeling the heat, potentially resulting in delays and hiccups in delivering goods worldwide. This adds yet another layer of complexity to government efforts to rein in inflation, as disruptions to the flow of goods can drive up prices. But it's not just financial strain that's troubling traders affected by the water shortage. As the queue of ships waiting to enter the canal from both the Atlantic and Pacific sides keeps growing, the risk of a major accident looms larger. The mountain congestion forces ships to drop anchor for prolonged periods, sometimes for days on end. In these crowded waters, with multiple vessels in close quarters, the risk of collision skyrockets. And up and down the U.S. coast. Amid the recent water scarcity gripping the Panama Canal, the pressing question arises, how can we safeguard this crucial water passage? Some suggest pumping seawater into Gatun Lake, the canal's main water source, but this idea hits a snag. Gatun Lake is vital for Panama's drinking water, and introducing salt water spells disaster for the country's water security. Other proposals, like redirecting rivers to replenish the canal, also raises eyebrows. While they may alleviate the water shortage, they often come at a hefty environmental price tag. Upsetting the natural flow of rivers can wreak havoc on ecosystems and jeopardize indigenous communities reliant on these waterways for their way of life. Simply tackling the Panama Canal's water woes with local fixes might not cut it. Experts stress the need for a broader approach to address the root cause, climate change, especially the relentless deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. As mentioned earlier, scientific findings highlight deforestation in the Amazon as a key driver of climate change, exacerbating the water scarcity affecting the Panama Canal. While some South American nations housing parts of the Amazon rainforest have taken steps to curb deforestation, greater cooperation is crucial. By sharing successful anti-deforestation policies and strategies, countries can bolster their efforts. Experts also stress the need for the United States, given its stake in the functioning Panama Canal, to step up its role in combating Amazon rainforest deforestation. Navigating the future of the Panama Canal poses both challenges and opportunities. The water shortage presents a tough dilemma for Panama's leaders, who must balance the canal's water needs with those of their people. With more than half the population relying on the same water sources, addressing the issue is paramount. To tackle it head-on, the canal's governing body recently proposed constructing a new reservoir in the Indio River. This initiative aims to bolster the water supply and ramp up traffic through the canal a cornerstone of Panama's economy, contributing over 6% to the nation's GDP. As per the plan, the new reservoir could pave the way for an extra 12 to 15 ships to transit the canal daily. But as with any grand plan, complexities abound. Erecting the reservoir comes with a hefty price tag of nearly $900 million, a substantial financial commitment for Panama. Plus, there's uncertainty surrounding the timeline, given past delays and budget disputes from a previous expansion project. Environmental concerns also loom large. The potential impact on the ecosystem, think plant and animal life, water flow and quality, demands thorough evaluation. Moreover, the project entails acquiring protected land and potentially displacing local communities, raising some ethical questions about fair compensation and relocation. Hence, while the proposed reservoir offers some promise, it's imperative to balance the economic gains with the possible environmental and social repercussions. The Panama Canal's future and the welfare of the Panamanian people pivot on a solution that balances economic prosperity with environmental and social responsibility. Right now, the fate of the Panama Canal hangs in the balance, and the potential fallout of its demise is immense. 
Imagine the shockwaves rippling across the globe if headlines blared. Panama Canal, the world's largest, runs dry. It's a chilling thought, isn't it? Global trade could screech to a halt, shortages and price hikes becoming the norm. Panama's economy, heavenly reliant on the canal, could suffer a severe blow, sending ripple effects across nations. And let's not overlook the potential for regional unrest as economic and social upheavals unsettle governments and citizens alike. As we confront the challenges posed by the Panama Canal water crisis, it's crucial to recognize the opportunities for collaboration and innovation. One promising avenue lies in the realm of sustainable water management practices. By investing in technologies that promote water conservation and efficiency, we can mitigate the impact of water shortages on both the canal and local communities. Additionally, exploring alternative sources of water, such as desalination or rainwater harvesting, could offer viable solutions to supplement existing water supplies. Furthermore, internal cooperation is essential in addressing the underlying drivers of the water crisis, particularly climate change and deforestation. Through partnerships between governments, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector, we can implement comprehensive strategies to protect and restore critical ecosystems like the Amazon rainforest. Initiatives aimed at reducing carbon emissions, preserving biodiversity, and promoting sustainable land use can help safeguard the ecological balance upon which the Panama Canal relies. In parallel, efforts to enhance water governance and the resilience at the local and regional levels are paramount. Strengthening monitoring systems, improving infrastructure, and fostering community engagement are all vital components of building a more sustainable water future for Panama and beyond. By embracing a holistic approach that integrates environmental stewardship, social equity, and economic prosperity, we can chart a course towards a more resilient and prosperous future for the Panama Canal and its surrounding communities. Together, let's rise to the challenge and seize the opportunity to safeguard this vital lifeline of global commerce for generations to come. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next video.